We've been focusing on the Gospel of Mark for a majority of 2024 so far, and we'll do that for the next few weeks here after Easter. In this uh, brief text, Jesus is telling a parable. A parable is a short story. It's not necessarily, hey, I saw this happen last week. It's not about real people Jesus encountered. He's telling a hypothetical. So he's telling this story, and they always have to do with the character of God and how we relate to God and how we relate with one another. And today I'd like you to especially pay attention to how Jesus introduces this parable and how he ends this parable. What are those bookends for what he's trying to say today? Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there, while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen! A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on a path. And the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no green. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. And he said, if you have ears to hear, then hear. The word of God for the people of God. God. Will you pray with me? Excuse me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In 2019, journalist Grace Seegers wrote a brief reflection on a social media platform about her email writing process. With a little bit of paraphrasing, it went something like this. Me writing an email. I'm using an exclamation point so you know I'm friendly and excited but now I'm using a period so that you know I'm not crazy. Here's another sentence with a period as a buffer, proving my normalness. Thanks so much, exclamation point. Can anybody relate to that? I can relate to that. Over 234,000 people clicked yes, I can relate to that, and I was one of those clickies. Now, later that day, Grace added an update to her post. She said, I just wrote an email using this exact format and became suddenly worried that the recipient would see this post and judge me for eternity. But later, things were definitely looking up. The post had been trending so fastly that day, so fast that day, that she added, oh my gosh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, the creator of the musical Hamilton, just reposted my post. I'm so proud. (laughs) The next day, she had another update. My spinning instructor came to class showing me an Instagram copy of my post. That's it. I have finally made it. (laughs) That last sentence, by the way, does not have any punctuation at the end. I finally made it. No period. No exclamation point. Listen. Today we start a new worship series called The Grammar of God. Yes, I think we'll have more fun than the title suggests. When you were in school, quick uh, survey here, how many of you found grammar to be a breeze or even kind of fun? All right, a few of you, sure, yeah. Also, I'm curious, how many of you found and maybe you still find grammar to be a chore, a necessary evil at best? Okay, a few of you. See, you would have been some of my favorite students. When I used to teach college English, I loved digging into how we communicate, how we do this, including with grammar. Now, while I met my fair share of students who enrolled because it was a required class, I also met a wonderful batch of students who cared about wanting to be understood more clearly, including through their writing. And isn't that what we all want? 
to be understood, to try to understand others better. Listen, whether it's in the Bible, in our lives, God is speaking to us. God wants us to understand this divine love for us all. Look, God speaks to us in a variety of ways. Are we listening? Now, our first bit of grammar, as we look at punctuation, is the exclamation point. Uh, another quick poll, I grew up calling it the exclamation point. That's what I was called. Anybody else, you grew up, it was exclamation point? Did anybody grow up with exclamation mark? Because when I look online, it's like equal. I did not know that. I'd never heard this mark thing. But uh, the exclamation point, it's usually used after an interjection, like look, or the exclamation wow. It's using, it's emphasizing strong feelings. Along with the period and the question mark, the, explanation, the ex exclam exclamation point is known as terminal punctuation because it ends the sentence. It terminates the sentence. Terminal punctuation, rated R, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I am curious, could you end a, uh, an argument like that? Like if you were frustrated by somebody and they were going on and on, you could say, I just don't want to talk about it anymore. They keep going. You could just say terminal punctuation. Would that work? Try it and let me know. There are a lot of musicals with an exclamation point in the title. Can anybody think of one off the top of your head? Oliver. Yes. Was there another one? Oklahoma. Yes. Moulin Rouge. That's a lot of musicals. Mamma Mia. Playwright Eugene O'Neill was notorious for using an excessive amount of exclamation points in his plays. And Dr. Seuss wrote over 60 children's books, and 14 of them have exclamation points in the title. Now, where did this come from? Well, there's a few theories. One theory is that it comes from a Latin word, eo, which looks like the letter is I-O, but I believe it's pronounced eo. Write a letter if I'm wrong. I want to know. Help me learn. But eo is this expression in Latin, an expression of joy. And it's as if to say, hooray! You would maybe put it at the end of a phrase to uh, emphasize just the joy of what, what happened. So many of us know, uh, vini, vidi, vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. It might be vini, vidi, vici, io, or io. I came, I saw, I conquered, hooray, that sort of thing. Uh, the theory goes that when this was written in Latin, for whatever reason, maybe to save space, maybe just handwriting, maybe just it happened, the I letter started to go above the O letter, and then eventually scribes started to just make that O into a dot. That's part of the theory. Also, other theories involved that scribes would often add symbols or marks to the manuscripts of uh, in the time of the Middle Ages to assist orators so they could emphasize a change in tone or what emphasis to use or when to pause. And this may have been one of those marks. The modern idea of the exclamation point was first used in the 14th century, and it came into English printing not as exclamation point or exclamation mark, but as a point of admiration in 1611. Some older typewriters don't even have an exclamation point. Does anybody have one of those typewriters without an exclamation point? The thought was, well, who needs a typewriter? A business. Who would not need to use an exclamation point? A business. So thus, they didn't have one. But I would say, put it to you that those people have not seen how many exclamation points I put in our church newsletter, the Heartline. A well-used exclamation point can bring a lot to the table. But if we go back to journalist Grace Seegers and her point, you can have too much of a good thing. If you type exclamation point or exclamation mark into a search bar online, you will find dozens of articles begging people not to overdo it with titles like, What Overusing Exclamation Marks Says About You? Think twice before using your next exclamation point. Why are people using so many exclamation points? And then the occasional, 
in defense of the exclamation mark, but then right back to our exclamation problem is getting worse. See, and you thought we'd run out of things to be angry about. <laughs> F. Scott Fitzgerald, he once wrote, cut out all these exclamation points. An exclamation point is like laughing at your own joke. Well, what does F. Scott Fitzgerald know, right? He knew a lot. He knew a lot, apparently. I did check the latest Heartline newsletter, just took a few seconds to hit Control F, and I was able to look up how many terminal punctuation marks we have in the March, April issue. 531 periods, question marks, and exclamation points. 11 question marks. 470 periods. 50 exclamation points, 9.4% of the end of sentence punctuation. Now, who wrote most of those? It doesn't matter who wrote most of those. <laughs> Just move on, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Listen, the writers of the New Testament, they did not have exclamation points. They didn't have much of punctuation at all to get their point across. If they wanted to emphasize themes or theology or the meaning of the words, they had to use the language itself. In that spirit, there are a handful of words in the New Testament that don't always have a vibe of an exclamation point, but there are some places where it really does. In today's text from the Gospel of Mark, we hear a form of one of these words. The word is listen. And it's conjugated here, but the root word is akuo, akuo. Now, when I tell you that there's a word that's about listening, and it sounds like it's akuo, that might make you think of another word in English. See, that's one of the fun things about reading the Greek of the New Testament. We have so many English modern words now that are derivatives of that Greek. So, for example, kartia in Greek is heart. And now we have a cardiovascular workout, for example, right? So when I say that we have a word about listening, and it's akuo, what modern English word do you think of? Acoustics, right. If you're going to sing really well, we want a room with good acoustics, right? So we can be heard. This is the word that Jesus uses to begin his parable of the sower. The people, they would have known this image of God already, this image of God as a farmer sowing seeds on the land. It's in Isaiah 55, yet another reminder of how Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. Here, Jesus is offering a new teaching about what kind of soil is receptive to the seed this farmer is planting, and thus how might we be responsive to God. Remember, it's about God's character, and how we relate to God and one another. And then he ends it with this phrase, if you have ears to hear, then hear. He, has, he says it another way somewhere else. He says, but anyone who has ears, listen. If you put it another way, Jesus is saying, be receptive to the seeds of faith that I'm planting here right now. He says, I started with listen. I'm ending with here, Jesus is bookending with akuo twice. Look, forms of akuo are not the only words Jesus uses to get his listeners' attention. One used more, more far often, far more often, is idu. Idu, the Greek letters would look like I D O U to us, idu. And idu means look, see, or behold. And boy, we just don't use behold like we used to, do we? No. Most modern Bible translations since 1950 or 1947, they don't really have behold in them as much. It's still there in the original Greek. And there are some say we lose some of that meaning if we don't have behold in there. But today, you're not saying behold a lot unless you're maybe trying to get a chuckle at Thanksgiving. Behold the mashed potatoes. The Christmas story has a do all over the place. A do, or behold, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. Or uh, Jesus, uh, oh, uh, behold, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Or behold, yet another angel appeared in yet another dream to Joseph. It's like the writer says, behold, this is an important story. 
Listen, it's elsewhere too. Jesus resists temptation in the desert, and as he resists temptation, it reads, Behold, and he has what he needs for his journey. Elsewhere, Jesus is with his disciples on the mountaintop, and he is transfigured before them, dazzling white, this light coming from him. And then it says, Behold, there are these visions of Moses and Elijah. Of their, of these disciples saw their religious and cultural heritage up there by his side. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus prays before he is arrested, And he goes to his disciples and says, could you not stay awake? He says to them, behold, my betrayer is at hand. Not every instance of idu is a profound wake-up call. This is not a a word study. And it's similar with language today. I mean, it won't always mean the same thing. We love our family. We love mashed potatoes. We don't love them equally, right? Right? We love one more than the other. It's it's family. Even wrote it down. (laughs) But the writers are reminding us, pay attention. Some things are important. Some things are important. Much of the disagreement within Christianity often stems from whether people believe Jesus said something was important or didn't. And what should be emphasized or what shouldn't be emphasized? And what's there on the page in the Bible coming out of Jesus' mouth? And what is maybe implied or what isn't there? That's going on in Christianity all the time. And you can try to prove your point. You can count up the instances of idu or akuo, of behold and listen. You can count up the frequency that a topic comes up. You can take what matters to you, and as long as Jesus seemed to mention it, you can go ahead and say, well, that's the most important thing. But if you do that, do maybe consider the frequency, because Jesus talks about being there for the poor a whole lot more than he says, persecute the people that make you uncomfortable. Now, by now, most of you know that I do not really care for theological debate, but I do love putting theology into action whenever we possibly can. The way that we get to the action part is by paying attention, by looking to Jesus, by listening to what he has to say, to build our faith in him, and then to take action with him because we have faith in him. Look, it is impossible for any one of us to pay attention to everything. We just do not have the capacity. Have you ever watched the news and just felt overwhelmed? All of this is going on. What do I even do? Where do I even start? I've had those feelings. And and none of us can pay attention to everything. There's no capacity. As a local church, we don't have the capacity. As an annual conference, we don't have the capacity. As an Episcopal area, as a jurisdiction, as a worldwide denomination of the United Methodist Church, we do not have the capacity to pay attention to everything. We can lament that, or we can lean into it. Meaning, we can get overwhelmed by everything, and then so overwhelmed we do nothing for anyone. Or we can get inspired by Jesus' call to look, to listen, and then to act. To look and to listen where we can, and prayerfully discern where we then shall act. And then take the action. Move from theory to practice. From thinking about it to praxis. And that last part, that seems to be one of the worst problems in the world, doesn't it? Wow, the world seems like it's got a lot of problems going on. I guess I'll just do nothing about it. That happens. Behold, get out there and do something. And if you have ears to hear, then hear. As a church, friends, we look and listen and take action in several ways. We have agreed to emphasize outreach for people who are refugees. We have agreed to seek new ways to make our church campus an exciting destination for the community and to invite neighbors to join in our outreach efforts. 
We have agreed as a church that we think feeding hungry people is a very good thing. We have agreed to focus on inclusion and value diversity in all of its forms. And we have agreed to be proudly united Methodist. One way that we do this is through UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And that's one way that we take a look around and take action for God as a denomination. Now, while it is true that we can have too many exclamation points, As United Methodists, we know that you can never have too many committees. And that's why we have UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. I didn't pick the name, but we have yet another committee. But this is a huge one, friends. And it has become bigger and bigger over the years as it takes on these causes. Uh, UMCOR, it's our global emergency response system as a denomination. It's how we aid asylum seekers here and abroad. It's how we distribute humanitarian aid here and abroad. It's how we address global health issues. And there's a lot of them. Today is Encore Sunday, and we are asking you to prayerfully consider a special gift that can go toward Encore to help with these causes, these causes that will change lives in the United States and around the world. We have a video for you about this. Behold. Did you know when you donate to the UMCOR Sunday offering, you support long-term sustainable development, U.S. and international disaster relief, global migration, and global health? As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to respond with extravagant grace. Through the United Methodist Committee on Relief, we are able to make a difference in the lives of communities and individuals whose lives have been upset by storms, wars, fires, displacement, and climate change. This offering underwrites UMCOR's costs of doing business, allowing UMCOR to keep the promise that 100% of any gift to a specific UMCOR project will go toward that project, not administrative costs. UMCOR specializes in solutions that help people become self-reliant. Help us be a source of help and hope for those in need. Your gift helps UMCOR stay until recovery is complete. Give in person, by mail, or online at umc.org slash ssgive. You can see why this is a very important offering that United Methodist Churches take all over the world. Very similar to your regular giving that goes to our operations budget for the church, that is the overhead. We are able to use that so that we can go off and do outreach and we can use special funding for that. And that's what UMCOR Sunday does. It pays for the overhead so that the gifts that are going to the causes are 100% for the causes. I'm going to invite Gail Johnson to join me. Gail Johnson is our lay leader, and she also works for the annual conference as a rock star event planner. I don't know if that's your official title, but it's pretty close. Uh, Gail, in a moment, I want you to tell us about the Hands on Service project that we're going to do, but can you tell us a bit about your experience working with UMCOR and VIM, which is Volunteers in Mission? So, Long ago, I felt called to disaster recovery, and I have taken some of the sexiest mission trips out there. I have been to Gulfport, Mississippi. I've been to New Jersey twice, and I spent six, eight weeks in Minot, North Dakota. (laughs) All of those were through UMCOR programs around disaster recovery. Um, And I could talk for a very long time about UMCOR, and Nate told me not to. But what you need to know is that UMCOR is known for being the first in and the last out in disaster recovery. They are already on the ground with organizations in 30 countries, which I would have trouble naming 30 countries and every state. And so that what that means is that when something happens, they already have structure. And the fact that they stay to be last out, there's a lot of groups who show up while the newsies are there, and it looks really good, and they're serving sandwiches, and they're doing a lot of things, and I'm going to be very good and not mention them by name. But um, we stay. 
And in Hurricane Katrina, that meant 10 years of mission trips to Louisiana. 10 years. By then, there were a whole lot of sexier, shinier things to worry about. Um, it just blows my mind. I have never been on a mission trip closer to one year from when it happened. Um, I never, I, I am certified as an early responder. That's a whole nother program. So there's early responders who go in while they're still putting up the blue tarps. There's um, recovery workers and rehabilitation. Um, it's got a weird name about making houses livable again. Those are the reconstruction people. There are VIMs, which are volunteers in mission. They go short and long term. So a short term mission trip is eight weeks for them. Um, and people stay years. There's the nomads and others who spend their entire year traveling with them. That's more than you wanted me to say. But, but there's, I'm there's, very passionate. What's well, an example of just how many opportunities there are and, yes. it, and this is one of the reasons why I love being United Methodist, is there are things that we can do here, and there's things that we can all do all together yes. for God. Uh, we have a hands-on mission uh, service project today. We're making mm -hmm. kits. What can you tell us? Okay. So one of the big things that UMCOR does is they maintain warehouses of supplies that are ready to go. Because if we first started putting things together when the disaster hit, we would never be in time. And so there's multiple kinds of kits that they pack. Some years we've done flood buckets so that when the flood hits or the fire, they can drop ship 100,000 buckets to help people clean up or 1,000 buckets or whatever that neighborhood needs. Um, today we are packing hygiene kits because when you can't get back into your house, you need a towel, a washcloth, a toothbrush, a nail clipper, which can be used in so many ways, um, a comb, and some band-aids. I mean, it's like the most simple thing that you can need, but the fact is, when disaster hit, when the fires broke out in, in Hawaii, there was no place to get that. In fact, very often, the speed of recovery is determined by the speed in which supplies can be delivered. In Louisiana, they couldn't get sheetrock into Louisiana fast enough to rebuild. That's part of what slowed everything down, was being a, who would get the first waves of supplies. So we are gonna pack 144, a gross, of um, hygiene kits today. And you will be surprised how fast those pack up. And it's hands-on, anybody can do it. They're stand-up jobs, they're sit-down jobs. They're mostly sit-down jobs today, but you know, Perfect. you can stand and do it if you like it better that way. Perfect, thank you so much, so. Gail. And what's great, folks, is, is we really encourage you to be part of that before you leave campus today, because what you'll need to know is that those packets, those kits, they will go to the depot, but they will not stay in the depot long, because we know disaster can strike at any time, anywhere. And those will get distributed, and you will help someone have a bit of God's peace in their lives when all else is chaos. And for folks who are worshiping the extended sanctuary of your home, yes, you're not here for that right now, unless you get in your car. Uh, but uh, there's other ways that you can participate, including in the special giving for UMCOR Sunday as well. Friends, Jesus says, listen. Jesus says, look. The Gospel of Matthew ends with the Great Commission. And in that Great Commission, Jesus says to his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and remember, I am always with you until the end of the age. Now, Jesus could have added that phrase, if you have ears to hear, then hear. But instead, that word in Greek for remember is edu. Behold. Remember, I am with you. Look, I am with you. Behold, I am with you. Jesus says, it is important to me that it is important to you. Friends, look to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. If you have ears to hear, then hear. May it be so, and amen. We're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark for much of this worship series. It's what we've been looking at for much of 2024. Now, these Gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And as for Mark, those first five chapters... 
very chock full, go very quickly. Jesus is baptized. He's called his disciples. He's done healings. He's taught with parables. And he's stilled the storm. And now he's sending his disciples on a mission, and they're going to share the good news. And he gives them parameters for what this looks like as they trust God moving forward. The Gospel reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 6b through 13. Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, Stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is in your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In 2013, British, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher died at the age of 87. Her time as a top leader in the UK proved divisive, her legacy left her dubbed the Iron Lady for her apparent stoicism in the midst of turmoil. Ms. Thatcher died as online social media was becoming more mainstream just over 10 years ago. Now, in Britain, many people wanted to talk about Ms. Thatcher's death, and they were posting on the Internet about it. They posted online to talk about their feelings. And they would end their uh, post with the phrase, now Thatcher's dead. But the phrase wasn't alone. The phrase had what's called a hashtag symbol. It's that symbol that's two lines going up and down and then two lines going back and forth across it. You add that symbol in front of a word or a phrase, and that will make it a link that anybody can tap or click and look at anybody else who is also writing about that topic. And so they were writing about hashtag now Thatcher's dead to talk about their feelings of the passing of one of their leaders. Now, hashtag now Thatcher's dead also spells another phrase. And in yet another great moment in internet history, people in the United States were lost in grief because they thought it read Hashtag, now that Cher's dead. Cher, the goddess of pop. In Britain, they understood, hashtag, now Thatcher's dead. In the United States, they thought, hashtag, now that Cher's dead. And people were stunned. Cher herself, uh, by the way, Cher did not die. She's still with us. And Cher did have millions of her fans tell her that she's very, they're very glad that she survived the Cher scare of 2013. We are continuing our worship series, The Grammar of God. God is still speaking to us through the Bible, through our life experiences in the world. And the big question is, are we listening? Last week, we looked at the exclamation point. We used, it's used for interjection and to add emphasis. We explored how some Bible writers sometimes use words that translate to look or to listen, to get our attention, and Jesus often did this to emphasize his teachings. Our next bit of grammar is the hashtag. You'll find it on your phone, you'll find it on the internet, and thousands of children across the great state of Minnesota found it on the sides of their number two pencils while taking the MCA tests last week. I, when I took it, it was the Iowa Basics. I don't know if you had standardized testing in your day, but let's hear it for those kids. They survived the week. 
The hashtag goes by a lot of names. There's number sign, you may have heard that, or pound sign. Maybe you've been prompted on a call, please press the pound sign or the number sign. Uh, in another nation, they call it the hex. Sometimes it's called the crosshatch. Sometimes it's called the octothorpe. It's similar to the sharp symbol in music, and you'll find another of its cousins on the kids' menu at your favorite restaurant so that you can play tic-tac-toe. Its name is often tied to its use, of which there are many today. The first hashtag that we think we've been able to find goes back to ancient Rome. In ancient Rome, they had an abbreviation, LB. And LB, that was short for Libra. That was used to mark the measurement for pound, or Libra Pondo, which I know sounds like a new facial cleanser from Sephora, but it's not. This is what the Romans used to measure weight. And yet again, we have this ancient language trend that's still in use today, because today we still use LB to mean pound, right? Now, as time went on, the scribes, who, when they would write LB, as time went on, they started to write a line through the top of LB to, to denote that it is a contraction or it's an abbreviation. And then as time continued, and scribes maybe got in a hurry, that handwriting made it look a little less and less like the LB with the line and more and more like the hashtag that we know today. It was used enough, especially in science innovations in the 17th century, Isaac Newton and others using this hashtag sign that printers started to add it to the printing press. And by the 19th century, the modern shape that we know came to be. And then it was added in the 20th century to the telephone system. As communications companies were moving from a rotary phone to the touchtone phone. Now, being born in 1979, I'm perhaps of the very last generation to have used a rotary phone on purpose, not for the novelty of it. And if you're out there and you don't know what a rotary phone is, it's this. Hi, may I speak to Aaron, please? Oh, I'm sorry. It's the wrong number. Yeah, we're, we're past that. One of the widest uses of the hashtag today is online, and that started, we know the date, August 23rd, 2007. It was a man named Chris Messina who wrote an online message to his friends. He asked, how do you feel about using the pound sign for our groups? And from that post, Boom, now typing a hashtag connected to a word or phrase to create a link that you could tap or click to find other posts related to that topic is everywhere. By saying uh, hashtag Richfield UMC, if you were to make a post, and you tap that and click that, you could find anyone else who's talking about Richfield UMC on the internet. The more posts there are on a topic that have this hashtag, the more uh, popular this trend is. And if you're like me and you were never popular, just put a hashtag in front of your name and see what happens. I'm rooting for you. Hashtags are used to rally people to social justice causes, to political causes. Some companies use it to sell their new product. And it also can connect people who are at conferences or other gatherings so that they can essentially pass notes, but this time it's electronically and quite publicly. It can be overused, just like the exclamation point we talked about last week. A great example is the word hashtag blessed. It was often used because people very heartfelt, heart, in a heartfelt manner felt blessed. Maybe you would write, it's so wonderful to have my whole family here for Thanksgiving, hashtag blessed. Or, I'm really feeling the Holy Spirit in the midst of my challenges in life, hashtag blessed. Or, I'm really grateful for my caramel macchiato coffee with extra foam, extra caramel drizzle, extra shot of caramel syrup, skim milk, 
hashtag blessed. That started to happen too. And yes, sadly, it got so overused, it became a parody of itself. But the point is, a hashtag is used in many ways, and one of the most prominent today is to indicate a trend, to indicate a movement, to indicate a cause to be aware of, to rally around, and to take action for. You can use it to be silly, you can use it to be sincere, but you always use it to make a point, a point that is hashtag worth it. In the gospel text for today, Jesus is sending his disciples out for a cause that he says is hashtag worth it. In the first five chapters of this gospel, Jesus has been baptized. He called and rallied his disciples. He taught them, and he's doing healings in the community. He's teaching the people in parables. He is still the storm. And here in chapter 6, right before this passage, they're in his hometown of Nazareth, where he is rejected. And he's rejected right in front of his students. Every teacher would love that, right? Jesus is rejected in his hometown of Nazareth in front of his students. And does he give up? Absolutely not. He says this is hashtag worth it. Jesus says, you know what, disciples? I'm going to send you off in pairs. Go out into the world in pairs, which makes sense. Because with a companion on your journey, you're less vulnerable to someone taking advantage of you. And you're more accountable so that you don't do that to someone else. If the mission isn't going well, they're there to help you through your disappointment. If the mission is going well, they're there to celebrate with you. Plus, the world can be lonely enough already. Now, we're not alone. God is with us. And having someone in your corner and being in someone else's corner, that can make a big difference in your life. And friends, if you need more people in your corner, come and talk to me. That's something the church is really good at. Jesus sends them out in twos and gives them instructions to only take a few things with them. A staff? Sure. Stay sturdy on the path. Sandals? Yes. You gotta walk the walk. Food? Mm, No food. You'll find it along the way. A bag and an extra tunic? Nah, you'll be fine. Money? Hashtag not so much. Instead, go out. Meet people. Show kindness. Rely on kindness. If that mutual display of trust and care is alive and well, you will do good work in my name. And if they aren't interested, if they rebuke you, If they say, no thanks, hashtag I gave at the office, let it go. Shake the dust from your feet and move on. You've learned something and other people need you. If you were to go out and about for the day, what is the absolute bare minimum that you could carry and feel safe? When Jesus sends out the disciples, it's not for a sightseeing tour. It's on a mission to share the good news and to invite people to repent. They have, these disciples, they've witnessed him teach and preach and heal. And now it's their turn. It's their turn. Now, no one said being a disciple would be easy. But there's one thing that Jesus gives them besides telling them, hashtag staff, yes, money, no. Jesus gives them authority. He says, you go out in my name. You go preach this mission. You go heal people of their demons. You go out and share what God is doing right here, right now in their lives. And remind these people, they are not just hashtag blessed. They are hashtag blessed to be a blessing. They've seen how Jesus changes people's lives. They have felt Jesus change their lives. And now it's their turn to engage people with it, to put faith into action. 
The point is, Jesus knows that all should know the love of God is the greatest trend, the greatest movement, the greatest cause to be aware of, the greatest cause to rally around, and the greatest cause to take action for. Jesus says sharing the love of God is always hashtag worth it. I'm moved reading that passage of student learners doing their best to become student teachers out in the world. I bet it was scary. I bet it didn't always go according to plan. I bet sometimes they doubted. I bet they felt the love of God, as did many whom they encountered. Is that not our responsibility today as the church, as the disciples of Jesus in the year 2024? Does Jesus not tell us get together with at least one friend, and uh, here's the authority to spread God's love. Shed yourself of bickering over preferences and imperfections, and hashtag drop your baggage, and get out there and hashtag change the world. I believe with all my heart, Jesus tells us that we can do this. We can show what God's love looks like in our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces, our relationships. The movement that wasn't just hashtag worth it then, but is hashtag worth it now. And when I say going to your workplaces and showing the love of God, I'm not saying you should go to your workplace, turn to your coworker, and say, have you accepted the love of Jesus Christ in your heart for all eternity? I'm not saying that. Some other pastor might say that. What I'm saying is this. Can you go to work and turn to your coworker who can be just as annoying as you are, and show them the love of God because that is what motivates you on how you engage them. Can you do that consciously, on purpose, with intention? Because that's the mission that Jesus sends us out to at work, at school, in our homes, with our relationships. If you were to go home from this place today, or for, if you're in the extended sanctuary of your home now, if you were to go out and about later, you are to pass by doors in the hall, or homes on the street, or, or apartments here, could you say, God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves you, as you pass by? Could you feel that in your heart? And what would happen to our neighborhoods is if, if each time we pass by a neighbor's home, in our heart we said, with truth, God loves that person. What could happen in our neighborhoods? There's one way that we are doing this, this movement of love, and that's through UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. We talked about it a little bit last week. It was UMCOR Sunday, and we received a special offering to support this humanitarian relief and development arm of the United Methodist Church. Now, this is how we come alongside fellow beloved children of God here and abroad who are suffering from natural disasters and human-caused disasters. We bring relief and response and long-term recovery efforts as a denomination. Last week, we talked a little bit about UMCOR Sunday. Here's a deeper dive into what UMCOR does. Take a look. In places all around the world, disaster strikes, families struggle, Homes and livelihoods are destroyed. People don't know where to turn. Hope is almost lost. And then, by the grace of God and through the support of people like you, UMCOR provides hope and healing to communities devastated by disasters. Part of the General Board of Global Ministries, UMCOR is a humanitarian relief arm of the United Methodist Church Working in the U.S. and in countries around the world, UMCOR offers help when natural or man-made disasters overwhelm a local community's ability to respond and seeks to improve the well-being of displaced peoples, migrants, and refugees. In the U.S., UMCOR partners with United Methodist Annual Conferences, working with disaster response coordinators, disaster response ministries, and early response teams to provide support for relief and recovery efforts. By working together with U.S. conferences, 
UMCOR's connectional approach helps communities recover faster and make survivors' lives whole again. UMCOR also responds to international disasters, providing a range of relief and recovery support through local Methodist churches and trusted partners, as well as ecumenical and non-governmental organizations. UMCOR's efforts to help communities become more self-sufficient and better prepared for future disasters include care for the environment and sustainable agriculture. Every day, around the world, UMCOR connects United Methodist Churches to God's mission by helping people who are suffering. As followers of Christ, we are called to protect the vulnerable, support the weak, and comfort those who mourn. To learn more or to give to UMCOR, visit umcor.org. That's why we do what we do. That's why we're a church. That's why it's hashtag worth it. Now, the slides went pretty quickly. Maybe I'm thinking of another video. Mitchell, did you see the, the flood buckets there, the big orange buckets? So as a youth group, I think it was that last year or maybe two years ago, we put together like 25, 30 of those flood buckets for helping clean up, and, and those got shipped out to one of the distribution centers. Last week, we made 144 hygiene kits that went out to a distribution center, or they will soon. Uh, that's one of the ways that we are helping as a church. I'm going to invite Jen Pasiga to come up and... Uh, get this ready for you. Jen is a church member, and she's a member of the church and society team. It's one of our elected leader teams, and they are in charge of our outreach efforts, organizing us, getting us going as a church. And uh, one of the things that we do as church and society is we have the rapid response relief grants. Uh, What can you tell us about those? Well, we get together Here, as... Let me, let me, we want to hear you. So. Oh, okay. We get together as a group, or we even email back and forth to each other when necessary, and we'll get in touch and say, have you heard about the floods in Turkey or the fires out west or whatever? And we'll say, that really stirred my heart. Don't you think we should send them some money? And that has been like $250 to specific events as they happen so like this year we've already sent two out and we'll continue to do that throughout the year as things happen so it's just kind of spur of the moment and things that are important to people that we need to react to yeah and and these grants are usually about 250 you said yeah. Yeah. and they're not always through umcor but they're often through umcor uh, UMCOR has something called advanced specials, or, or these are special opportunities for giving. There's one for like U.S. disaster relief, international. <clears throat> right. We gave to the Turkey-Syria earthquake, yep, I think last did. year. Uh, I wrote down a couple others. The Maui wildfires, when those happened, we gave a grant this year, the Texas wildfires. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, in, the, in the Northeast, in the United States, when there were floods last year. I'm, I'm curious, Jen, how does being on the church and society team How does that help you put your faith into action? Well, that's exactly what it is, putting your faith into action. And it shows caring and concern for people around us and then just giving out of the abundance that we have. We have so much. Why can't we share that with other people when they're going through a hard time? Yeah. And what would you say to someone who's interested in joining the team this year? get in contact with with you and or with pastor hope someone that's on the committee and let us know that you're interested because we always need concerned people to show the love of jesus to others Excellent. that's what it's all about thank you thank you so much yeah, for sharing you. today appreciate it those rapid response relief grants those uh For the first two years that we did them in 2022 and 2023, those were funded by the Richfield Foundation. We proposed we'd like to uh, have this number of dollars that we can distribute in this way over the course of the year, and uh, they were very generous and granted those. This year, Church and Society is funding those grants out of the restricted funds that are designated for outreach. And uh, that fund is from people like you, and thank you so much for your generosity there. Friends, we're able to do rapid response relief grants 
and service projects like the hygiene kits last week because we believe in why Jesus sends us out as disciples. This movement of God's love is hashtag worth it. And we are all hashtag blessed to be a blessing. It's not about whether it's hashtag now Thatcher's dead or hashtag now that Cher's dead. It's about the movement based in a simple holy truth. Hashtag now Jesus is alive. May it be so and amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 8, and uh, this is almost smack dab in the middle of the Gospel of Mark. It's 16 chapters, and here we see uh, Jesus asking big questions to his disciples. Is that a rhetorical question? Does he hope that they have learned enough that they know the response he's hoping for? I don't know that it's a test, but certainly he's interested in knowing what they know, because that will help them as they continue on their journey of teaching, preaching, and healing in the world. The Gospel reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 37. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who want to, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In 1984, 80-year-old Clara Peller became one of the most famous people in the United States. Her family immigrated to the United States from Russia when she was a child. As an adult, she was a manicurist in Chicago. That got her hired as a manicurist for the talent of a TV commercial that was shooting in a barber shop in Chicago. And the producers and the talent agency, they were so struck by her unique combination of a gravelly voice and some sassy mannerisms that they said, you got to do some showbiz. And they hired her as an actor. She did a few commercials, and then came the big one. On January 10th, 1984, a commercial debuted featuring three elderly women served a gigantic hamburger bun that had just the tiniest burger patty on it, to which Clara uttered, and let's say it together, where's the beef? The fact that you remember that 40 years later says something. 40 years ago this year, that uh, ad campaign for Wendy's, it bumped it up into becoming the sixth largest fast food franchise in the world. And that year alone, it had a 31% increase in its sales, or an extra $292 million. 
Where's the beef was everywhere. T-shirts, bumper stickers, swag. She sang a song about it with a, a musical artist. Uh, vice presidential candidate Walter Mondale used it in the vice presidential candidate debates. Wendy's employee, Denny Lynch, said, with Clara, we accomplished as much in five weeks as we had in 14 and a half years. We continue our worship series, The Grammar of God. God is still speaking to us through the Bible and through our experiences. Are we listening? We saw two weeks ago how exclamation points uh, add emphasis, and we explored how some Bible writers and Jesus sometimes use specific words that will translate to look or to listen, to get our attention and focus us on what matters to God. Last week, we talked about hashtags and how especially on the internet, they're used to indicate a movement, something to focus on. And we explored how Jesus sends his disciples out in his day and how Jesus sends us as disciples out now for this movement, this mission of love. Our next piece of grammar is the question mark. It's the terminal punctuation used when you ask questions. Like some of the questions you might have today, like, what do you want to do for lunch today? How long is the sermon today? Did I leave the iron on when we left the house today? No, seriously, how long is the sermon today? <laughs> like other modern punctuation, the question mark has a mysterious history. If you go back to the 5th century, there are some Bible manuscripts that use these vertical double dots over the first word of a sentence to indicate it's a question. By 783, in other Bible manuscripts, you get this almost lightning-like mark that's indicating intonation. And it kind of looked like, uh, you know the tilde? It's like a hyphen, but it's kind of a squiggly one. It kind of looked like that. And later, it was given the Latin name punctus interrogativus. You can hear the interrogative in there. By the 13th century, these lightning flash marks were being broadly assigned as interrogatives, as questions, and the stroke gained that sharp curve. And by 1598, in the English language, it's called the point of interrogation. And in the 1850s, it's essentially called and looks like and functions like how we know it today. Famous questions come and go with culture. And though not every generation knows every one of these famous questions or their context, it's amazing how many of us have heard them before. Uh, for example, we have many famous advertisement or commercial questions besides, where is the beef? Got milk? Can you hear me now? Pardon me, have you ha do you have any Grey Poupon? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Lots of famous movie questions from the last 50 years. You talking to me? Uh, let's see. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow from to have and have not. Why so serious? Asked the Joker and Batman. Badges? We ain't got no badges from the treasure of the Sierra Madre. How about, yeah, what's up, Doc? And of course, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? A very important question from the movies. Now, Shakespeare has got some of the most long-lasting questions ever. These are questions that are 400 years old, and you know them. If you prick us, do we not bleed? Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? A tu brute, to be or not to be, that is the question. And here's three of my favorites from prose and poetry. The velveteen rabbit, the rabbit made of that soft velveteen who yearns to be real, hears the other animals talk about, you know, what's real, and that rabbit's not even real. And they ask, what is real? And real is on all caps that wonderful book by Marjorie Williams. Where you go to Alice in Wonderland, Alice and, and the caterpillar meet, and the caterpillar continues to ask her, who are you? And it's a pretty existential question, isn't it? Or you go to The Summer Day, the poem by Mary Oliver, 
and that haunting and yet beautiful closing line, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Questions endure because we are curious creatures. Good writing is part of it. Worthwhile topics are another. But at its heart, a question is permission to wonder if there is more behind the reality that we know. We wonder what came before, how it is now, and where it goes next. Life is filled with mystery And questions are how we dwell in it and move through it and come to peace with it. I'm really grateful that as a church, we value questions about God, faith, life, and and we enjoy seeking answers together. The Bible is filled with questions. If you go to the Psalms in particular, these hymns and poems uh, written to and about God, you're going to see dozens of speakers all crying out with questions. Why God? Why? When God? When? Essentially, are you their God? It's me, the psalmist. It's, It's to the point where every once in a while people will tell me, you cannot question God. Never question God. Absolutely not. And I think, have you read the Bible? The Bible is filled with people over and over questioning God. I don't think that that just stopped then. And it's not just humans who ask questions in the Bible. One of my favorite stories in Scripture is the book of Jonah. And if you have never read Jonah, you just remember broad swaths of Jonah. You remember like a whale on a flannel board, that kind of thing. Take a moment to read Jonah. It's four chapters you'll be done in less than 15 minutes. But Jonah ends with a question from God. At the end, Jonah is so mad at God because God has saved the city of his enemies. Jonah essentially says, I knew you loved everybody, and he's mad about it. And God says, well, look, last night you slept under that tree, and you're pretty concerned about that tree, even though you didn't help to grow it right. And Jonah's like, yeah. So God says, if you're concerned about that tree and you didn't help it grow, shouldn't I be concerned about this city and all the thousands of people and all of the animals? It ends there. It ends on God asking, what about the cows, Jonah? What about the cows? I love that. In the Gospels, Jesus asks over 300 questions. He's asked over 180 questions. He directly responds to like three of them. Is it possible that our beloved teacher is more interested in the living the questions than getting the answers? In the text today, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they respond. Some say uh, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, the ancient prophet. But then he amps up the ask, and he says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter bravely responds, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, keep it under wraps for now. And he goes on to give them more answer than they could have possibly bargained for. He says, one day I'll suffer, I'll be rejected, I'll be killed, and I will rise again. A big question needs a big answer, and Simon Peter's not ready for that. And it says, Simon Peter rebuked Jesus. And by the way, if you're going to rebuke Jesus, good luck with that, Simon Peter. Simon Peter rebukes Jesus. Jesus rebukes Simon Peter right back. And then he, he turns to the crowd. He turns to the disciples and he says, you know, if you follow me, you deny yourself and you're taking up your cross. You lose your life for my mission and thereby you save your life. What will it profit you to seemingly gain it all only to lose what I have to give. Put another way, 
What is real for God's mission? Who are you, beloved child of God? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Will you take up your cross and follow me? Maybe if we say we'll put our faith into action, but we don't do faith in action, maybe Jesus asks us, where is the beef? Reverend John Wesley was the primary founder of the Methodist movement, and he was dedicated to seeking the best methods of turning faith into action. He wanted others to do so as well. He encouraged people to form small groups for Bible study, for prayer, but also for personal accountability. And the main question was, how is it with your soul? Beyond that, he also wrote these 22 questions of self-examination. I'm going to invite Victor up for this, because we're going to take a look at these. These 22 questions of self-examination by Reverend John Wesley, which to this day, it's a mix of motivating and very convicting. So how would you stack up with these? I'm going to invite you Put your feet flat on the floor, maybe close your eyes, and I'll make you a deal. If you truly ponder these 22 questions for your life, I will not ask you to respond out loud and tell us how you're doing. So here are these 22 questions from John Wesley on self-examination. Am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I am better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Am I honest in all of my acts and words, or do I exaggerate? Do I confidently pass on to another what was told to me in confidence? Can I be trusted? Am I a slave to dress, friends, work, or habits? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? Did the Bible live in me today? Do I give it time to speak to me every day? Am I enjoying prayer? When did I last speak to someone else about my faith? Do I pray about the money I spend? Do I get to bed on time and get up on time? Do I disobey God in anything? Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? How do I spend my time? Am I proud? Do I thank God that I am not as other people, especially as the Pharisee who despised the publican? Is there anyone whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold a resentment toward or disregard? If so, what am I doing about it? Do I grumble or complain constantly? Is Christ real to me? Those are some tough questions. Motivating, inspiring, convicting. Those are something for us to think about, friends. Now today, as a church, we have questions, and one of them is, how will we as a church deny ourselves and take up our cross to follow Jesus on a mission for the greater good, for the good of our neighbors? One of the ways we are responding to that question is with our new signature ministry in outreach, that is, with and for people who are immigrants and refugees. Last fall, we uh, had a donation drive through the Minnesota Council of Churches so that we could give to these people who are uh, escaping extreme violence and poverty. What is God calling us to do next? Last fall, the Minnesota Council of Churches, our new partner, they sent Okuni Agid to tell us her refugee story. And today we have an abridged version for you. And you can uh, revisit this and her extended talk on our YouTube channel. It's very shareable with your friends. Let's let this video renew our questions of how can we help our new neighbors? 
How can we welcome new neighbors? How can we show them the love of Jesus with faith and action? Let's listen to Okuni's story. I'm really blessed to be here with you today as I, ch- I share my journey. Why I left my country and the blessings that I have today in the United States. And in December 2003, the crisis started in Gambela. The killing was going on village to village, village from village. When I was already two months pregnant, expecting my second child, Uh, soldiers come at night in my house and call out my husband and they kill him immediately. And that was the time I left Gambela. I left Gambela without seeing my back, taking my little child and the, the other child in my womb. By July, I was looking for a way to go to a refugee camp, at least to go and give, uh, to deliver. Coming to Kenya, you have to wait for the transportation trucks, which, and the trucks are for business. So you have to stay at the station and make sure the truck is full before you leave the, the, the border. And that's what happened to me. I waited at the, at the station for three days, and I gave birth of my second child. And then that's where we have start our journey to come to Kenya using the transport, the truck, with a baby, with a three days old baby and a toddler. We, there's a days we go without water, there's a days we go without food, but uh, the only thing kept me going was maybe faith in God, because every time I put my, myself to, to sleep, I'll just kneel down and pray and talk to God that I just need a better life for, for me and my children. And when the life was going, getting worse and worse every day, uh, I didn't give up on God. Coming to United States, and I was blessed with a very members, beautiful family from Messiah Methodist Church who has never left my side since I came in 2018. Until today, they never left my side. We got beds. We got chairs, we got dining tables, we got cooking items, and also the food. So they, they were volunteering with everything, furniture, and they were there doing everything. I asked God before I came to the United States was, God, give me a better life so that my kids cannot experience what I went through. And that is what God uh, did. God hears prayers. No matter, how we, we, we don't have to give up on God. That's the only thing I want to say, because if it's not by God, I will not stand in front of you today and share my story. Kuni's story is very powerful. You can hear her entire witness when she was here in November, I believe it was. Again, it's on the YouTube channel and this abridged version, very shareable, as we heard from one of the speakers from our partner, the Minnesota Council of Churches. I'm going to invite Terry Bumgarner to come on up here. Terry is a longtime member of the church. Uh, how long have you been a member, Terry? Since I was born. Since you were born? 39-year member. <laughs> Phenomenal. Uh, Terry, uh, I wanted to ask you to come up because uh, as our church, we're getting our toes wet in, in working with people who are immigrants and refugees. I know you've had some personal experience. What can you tell us? It's amazing reward when you see how broken and tired uh, the human being can become and then you can come forth and smile and welcome. It's, it's a great feeling. As people are coming to Minnesota from very different walks of life, different cultures, different climates, what are some of the big challenges you found people have coming to Minnesota? The- Climate is a big one. Um, I learned very quickly that wearing winter clothing can feel very heavy to people, and they don't want to wear it, and their body becomes very tired from wearing a winter jacket. But time and time again, we had to remind them that they need to cover their fingers, 
Otherwise, they freeze. We did have a situation with a family uh, whose fingers did get a little frostbite. And what do you do? You put it under hot water. No, because it's very painful. So you can't put it under hot water. What? We don't put it under hot water? And then the other thing we have really come to appreciate is they are so um, appreciative of everything, whether it's housing, clothing, cooking, and they, are vi they don't want to rock the boat. So if something breaks, they don't speak up. And so you have to really um, ask questions and make sure that um, you can help when something breaks down because they just think, it's okay, I can, I can do without it. I can figure out something else to do, uh, use something else. But when, it, when you ask them, they go, oh yeah, the drain has been backing up for a month. Uh, we just mop it up. It's okay. No, it's not okay. You can ask for help. And that's the big thing, asking for help. In a way, you're talking about something they call cultural competency. That is mm -hmm. to have a cross training or understanding of different cultures. And if they're coming from a place where that's just how you do it, but knowing that there's other resources here, it's, exactly. it's a re-education. Yeah. Uh, and food and groceries, oh my goodness, mm. it's overwhelming. And it's wonderful in Minnesota because there are many, many grocery stores now that um, offer things that they recognize. And, um, but to go and have choice, it's amazing. Yeah. There are so many stories out there uh, about people who are immigrants, and uh, I'm curious... What has been your experience? What do people need to know from your experience about people who are immigrants? They are so loving. They are very tired. They are very worn down when you first meet them and bring them into your heart. But they want to do, they want to support themselves. And they will do anything, anything to help support themselves and um, very uh, industrious, and they, they are hard workers, very hard workers. All right, Terry, last question. How has working with folks in these situations, how has that impacted your faith? I just repeat over and over in my head, um, do good. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate your time today and for all the work that you've been doing for folks. Amen. <laughs> Friends, uh, there's my amen, because my manuscript actually doesn't have an amen. I'm going to end it like the book of Jonah with a question. God asks each of us a question. By your faith and action, each of us individually and collectively as a church, what will you do with your one wild and precious life for your neighbor, your fellow child of God? And what about all the animals? Today's scripture is short. It's the very last two verses of the Gospel of John. At this point in the Gospel of John, Jesus has appeared resurrected. He appeared to Mary by the tomb. He appeared to the disciples in the upper room. And then he appeared to them and Thomas again. He has appeared on the beach. He's had breakfast with them. He has had a moment of reconciliation with Simon Peter. And then this is the final two verses that the writer gives us about not just this gospel, but a living gospel. So the gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In 2014, dairy truck drivers in Maine took their employer to court for years of unpaid overtime wages. Maine state laws said that businesses must pay time and a half for hours worked over 40 hours a week, with exemptions for, quote, the canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, packing for shipment or distributions of, one, agricultural produce, two, meat and fish products, and three, perishable foods. But there's a trick about that law that made things unclear. In that list, there is no comma between packing for shipment and or distribution of. And the courts ruled that, yes, that law is not clear. It doesn't clarify if it exempted distribution of the three categories or if it exempted packing for the distribution of those categories. And there was a lot of comma drama. How much? $5 million worth because the dairy company agreed to pay $5 million to its driving force. And the Maine state legislature, they changed that law to add clarity. And now each item in that list, including packing for shipment and distribution of, those are all now separated. Not by commas, but by a semicolon. And of course, everybody knows exactly how semicolons work all the time. We continue in our worship series, The Grammar of God. God is still speaking to us through the Bible and through our life experiences. The big question is, are we listening? A few weeks ago, we saw how exclamation points add emphasis. We explored how some Bible writers and Jesus sometimes use words to get our attention and help us focus on what's important to God. We saw how hashtags build trends and it builds movements. And we explored how Jesus sent out disciples in his day and sends out people today to rally others to the mission to join a movement of love. Last week we saw how question marks in scripture and in our lives today encourages us to always be seeking, wondering, growing on our faith journey and deepening our discipleship. Our next piece of grammar is the comma. The mark that looks like a period with a beard. An apostrophe that slipped. A quotation mark without a partner. Half a semicolon who doesn't really know what it's doing. Now when it comes to marks like commas, remember that first came alphabets and then came punctuation. If you take the Wayback Machine to the third century BCE, Greek scholar Aristophanes of Byzantium is adding accent marks to Greek writings to give the orators who would speak it direction on tone and pitch and emphasis. And around 200 BCE, he begins adding a single dot in the middle of a line of text. And that is meant to show how much breath orators need as they speak. You may have seen a dot in the middle of a sentence if you go somewhere that has like a phrase in Greek or Latin, maybe etched in stone somewhere. You thought, why is there a dot in the middle? Now you know the origin of that dot. Single dots placed mid-level in short lines were in Greek, coma. For a longer line, a dot placed a little lower at level with the bottom of the text were in Greek, colon. And to indicate exceptionally long pauses marked near the top of the line in text, they were in Greek, periodos. Coma, colon, periodos. Are you hearing this? Yeah. The comma that we use today, it's low to the text, and it combines the dot with the slash mark from the 1200s, 1300s, and the modern comma as we know it today came about 1500 or so. Commas have several uses in U.S. English as a language, and it's to separate and to make space. 
They separate items in a list. They separate clauses in a sentence. They separate cities from states as you write a card. They make space for connecting adverbs like however or therefore. They make space for parenthetical phrases like in a positive to introduce somebody's credentials. And they make space to breathe. How many times have we as a church joined in a centering prayer or a call to worship or a prayer of gratitude, and we joined it as a church, and we all kind of wish that either I or the writer had to put in a few more commas to take a breath more naturally? Plus, very important, commas save lives. Commas save lives. It's true, because making space for a comma, that is the difference between let's eat everybody and let's eat everybody. The comma is a simple, multidimensional thing. We're glad for it. Now, you may recall comedy duo and married couple George Burns and Gracie Allen. Uh, on stage, Gracie played it zany. George played it straight. They would often end their routine, say goodnight, Gracie. Goodnight, Gracie. So the story goes, in her final love letter to her husband before she passed away, Gracie Allen wrote this. Never place a period where God has placed a comma. Never place a period where God has placed a comma. Put another way, you don't get to decide to put God in a box. We don't get to decide when God is done speaking. We don't get to say all of God's love is shipped, distributed, end of story, period. A few years back, the United Church of Christ adopted this phrase as part of their God is still speaking campaign. Similar to the United Methodists' open hearts, open minds, open doors slogan, it's a way to say that we are still on a faith journey. Because if the writings of the Bible, if that's the end of the story, if that's the period, truly do we think the Holy Spirit is not still breathing life today. In a way, the Gospel of John ends with a comma, those last two verses. The writer is a disciple himself. He ends the story by writing that there are more stories to share. There are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the book's that would be written. Is Jesus still doing things today? Is the Holy Spirit right here, right now? Is God still speaking? Are we listening? These past two weeks, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church finally met because this is not General Conference 2024. This is delayed General Conference 2020 due to the pandemic. And friends, the Holy Spirit was in that room. It's naive to say that everyone agreed with everything. Show me any group of people who agrees on anything, everything. But it is safe to say that there is a palpable desire to be the united Methodist Church, to take action, to move forward, to breathe and serve God together. The worship was inspiring. You can see it at their YouTube channel, youtube.com slash UMC videos. Take a look at those bishop sermons. Wow. First of all, they're great. Second of all, they're inspiring. Third of all, if you think mine are long, some of those are like 45 minutes. So just so you know. The legislative plenaries, those are also pretty good. They have some amazing moments in plenary. There's also some tedious moments. I was especially fascinated by the day when several people went to the mic to propose a new way to save time, which was allegedly uh, better than the previously proposed way to save time, which was allegedly better than the previously proposed way to save time. It took some time. 
predominantly, or prominently rather. This last week, the United Methodist Church removed all harmful language, putting lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and curious people, removed all the harmful language that puts these people in a box. Yeah. Removed all the language that put them in a box labeled incompatible with Christian teaching. The label is separated. The box is discarded. That period is over. Never place a period where God has placed a comma. So what does it mean? With all harmful language around LGBTQ plus people removed from our United Methodist Book of Discipline, not paused, but removed. And this harmful language, which, by the way, in an effort to do no harm, I will not repeat it here. With that language removed, United Methodist ordination candidates can fully be themselves. United Methodist clergy can fully be themselves. United Methodist funds can support LGBTQ plus affirming ministry and causes. Any United Methodist Church can hold any wedding ceremony they wish. Any United Methodist clergy can officiate any wedding they wish and continue to not have to do any wedding they don't want to. And none of it is any longer a potential chargeable offense. It is my joy to write a list with so many commas. As a worldwide denomination of the many cultures and traditions and theologies that make up this big tent called United Methodism, we decided together to separate less and make space for more. We paused so that we could move on. And many people are breathing much easier today, thanks be to God. Now, many things happen at General Conference, and we've given you some links on where you can find those. We'll put a few more in the next uh, Tuesday email newsletter. Sign up today or re-sign yourself up. Remember, if you unsubscribe, you've got to resubscribe yourself. So we'll get that out to you. But I wanted you to hear this part from me, because this is pretty big news. I want you to hear it from me as your pastor, because here's the thing. Churches can be cruel, and churches can get it wrong. Faith leaders can get it wrong. I get it wrong, and the harm is real, and I'm sorry for my part. You know, with, with matters of justice, we try to do the best we can to do no harm and do good and grow in love with God, and we also discover along the way all the things we could have done more. And I could have done more. I'm glad for what I did, and I wish I could have done more. So what I'm going to do is keep doing what I can. And I'm glad the church has a new opportunity to get it right. And I'm grateful to be a part of it, and I'm grateful to be right here, right now with you. I know that many of you sought this for a long time. I know many of you have been harmed or know someone who's been separated by our denomination's language. And some of you may not know what to do with all of this change. And all of you are the church. All of you understand that while no church or institution is perfect, a people who love God, a people who care about each other, a people who want a better world for their neighbors, they are a powerful people indeed. The past 30 or 40 years, the church, and when I say the church, I mean capital C church, the overall church, the church has felt numerical declines on many fronts. Membership, worship attendance, giving, participation. And there are many reasons for that. And we'll talk about a few of those this summer during the So Many Questions series, and we'll also talk about some of the responses that we can do as a church. But kind of like how no one knows what to do with a semicolon, no one quite knows 
what to do with the mystery of what's next for the church. And this spans denominations, generations, geography, theology. And I wish that I could pause here today and tell you that everything that we have done as a denomination in the past two weeks will automatically grow this church and thousands of other churches until we are busting at the seams as if it's an automatic switch. But I can't say that. The truth is, we don't know what others will think about it. Some may say, too little, too late. Others may say, that's great, but I'm still not a church person. And still others may say, that's great, but you also have a couple other dozen institutional issues to handle before I would even think about it. And those people are where they're at, and that's okay. And each of those kind of feelings, it does kind of feel like putting a period on the work of the United Methodist Church. But I suppose we've still got a few surprises left in us. I suppose when it comes to sharing God's love, it's never too little too late. I suppose the church can still partner with people outside of the church. But I suppose we can step up to the challenge of other institutional issues. But I suppose that the world itself cannot contain the books that are yet to be written about what Jesus is doing with the church. But I suppose we are stepping together to the next part of the sentence, the part that comes after this long pause, this 52-year coma, comma. And it will be up to us to live it out. It's one thing to say all means all. It's another thing to believe it and to take action on it and to make space for it. Because we know hearts not changed by legislative action, but by the action of love, of listening to other stories, by sharing our own, by extending grace and separating from revenge. Because if any one of us are ready to go forward shouting, ha ha, look what we did in your face, whoa, you might need a pause, a comma, a breath. If we skip that comma, that could cost us Wouldn't it be better to say, love grows here. Let's move forward together. Living into this new identity as Richfield United Methodist Church, it will only help us to fulfill our mission that we believe God's divine desire is for this world to be a space where all may live in faith, justice, and joy. And I cannot wait to see what Jesus does next nor to read these books to be written. Here is one of the ways that Jesus is still writing with us. Our church loves feeding people. When we put out the call for food drives, whether it's actual food or donations, you answer the call. You love to make sure that kids aren't going hungry, that parents aren't trying to make a choice of who gets to eat that week and to build more sustainable systems for food insecurity to become food security. One of the ways that we're doing that is through Meals on Wheels. We've been involved in Meals on Wheels for decades, and we have reached a comma because we are in need of new people who will join in and give this a shot for about one hour a month. And I got a chance to shadow our organizer, DeWitt Killam, the other day to learn what Meals on Wheels is like. I invite you to take a look. I'm DeWitt Killam. Uh, uh, I and my wife have been a member of Richfield United Methodist Church for 55 plus years. One of the programs I got involved in in Meals on Wheels was Meals on Wheels. Uh, Jim Hunter, a gentleman who's no longer with us, uh, asked me to volunteer to deliver meals. Uh, and I initially told him no because of my work schedule. But about 20, 22 years ago, I told him I retired and would be available. And for a couple of years, I delivered Meals and Wheels uh, 
it, once a month. And uh, finally, oh, I'm going to guess 15, 17 years ago, I uh, took over the leadership of Meals on Wheels for Richfield United Methodist Church. It's a program to get meals to people that uh, are either disadvantaged financially or uh, uh, mobility-wise, uh, and they need meals. Uh, uh, we are finding right now that many of our recipients have a caregiver who is working, uh, and they need meals for lunch, and we provide it. It's people that actually want to see you. Uh, I used to be an insurance adjuster many years ago, and they'd almost throw me out of the home. Now they invite me in. <laughs> the program has changed through the years. We uh, uh, deliver meals once every four weeks. Almost all of our volunteers only spend uh, uh, one to maybe an hour and a half max uh, delivering meals, and that includes going and coming from their home to get the meals. We'll have five to seven, eight meals each of us to deliver. Actually, we often we're carrying two containers. It may be a hot container and also a bag uh, which will, might contain a dessert. Good morning, Meals and Wheels. What are you looking here? I'm a little bit late today. There's a regular, and this is your hot lunch. Enjoy and have a good day. You're never late. Thanks for what you're doing. Oh, okay, well, I'm early. <laughs> there you go. I appreciate hearing that. I thought I was late. Yeah, have a good one. Well, thank you. Enjoy your meal and have a good day. Okay, you do. Bye. God wants us to uh, love and care for each and all of us, in my own words. Uh, and I think this is an extension of that. One of the things about being volunteering for Meals and Wheels, you don't have committee meetings. Uh, I, um, I've had too many committee meetings in my life. I, I want to get out and do something, not sit around and talk about doing something. We need you. Our, our recipients need you. And it's only going to take one hour every four weeks. Okay, I'm Dewitt Killam. Uh, uh, I and my wife have been a member of Richfield United Methodist Church for 55 plus years. And this is just part of our commitment to living in faith, justice, and joy. I'm gonna invite DeWitt Killam up. DeWitt is here in person, 55 year members. He and his spouse, Phyllis, and glad to have you. Thank you so much for all the information in the video, uh, but I also wanted to give you a chance, DeWitt, to let us know uh, why has this ministry been worth your time and energy in these last couple of decades? Well, thank you. Um, I guess my philosophy is it's good to give to a charity. It's good to volunteer for a charity. But in my case, the best thing I can experience is not only volunteering for that charity, but having direct contact with the people we're serving. Uh, I can recall a number of occasions where coming up the door, say in January, they open the door, they're waiting for me, they're anxious to see me, and then they don't know if they should start eating immediately or talk to me for a few minutes. <laughs> it's a good feeling. At, at night when I go to bed, I'm trying to recap the day, if that happens, that's number one on the list. I love it. Do it. We are, uh, to use the metaphor I've been using, we're in a comma, we're in a pause, because uh, you have been doing these calls to organize people for, I think you said, 17 years or so, something like I that. I think so, yeah. And, and you'd like to take a break from that. Uh, so, well, yeah, so I, the time has come, I think, for me. You bet, you bet. And so we're looking for somebody who can take over this calling to folks like once a month. And uh, who, who are the people that we need now on this team? Well, we need somebody that can devote a half hour a month contacting the volunteers, uh, eliciting new volunteers to participate. We currently are maybe short a volunteer or two. Uh, many of my volunteers have been with Meals on Wheels longer than I have. Yeah. Uh, uh, almost all of them are in this church. I won't mention their names now because it's, it's a long list. But, uh, and some of them are unfortunately no longer with us. Yeah. And it's about an hour a week, or an hour a month on a Monday, 
What is it? Uh, well, for the coordinator, it'd be a half hour okay. uh, once a month to call and talk to people, remind them that, yes, they again are going to be on their normal route and their uh, normal time. Um, uh, and they are going to have to pursue um, new volunteers from time to time and fill in. That's the good part, to yeah. get to fill in and meet these people. I'd like to tell you all the stories, but I won't. <laughs> so find a way to hear more stories. And if this is stirring your heart, you're like, I can drive once a month and deliver meals to my neighbors. I can do a few calls to my church members. Uh, come and talk to us, okay? And we will help you. Let's hear it for DeWitt and all of our drivers, past and present. Thank you so much. Thank you. Friends, friends, God works overtime to breathe divine love, care, comfort into all people without exemptions, packing life for shipment or distribution of forgiveness-filled grace and justice-filled mercy. Every day we live, everywhere we go, and we will never say goodnight to God's grace. There is no period, only commas. God's love is a simple, multidimensional thing, and I'm glad we have it. Breathe it in. Jesus is doing something new, and no books can contain it. May it be so, and amen. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, and it tells of Jesus calling one of his disciples. It's the disciple named Levi. In Matthew, he's named Matthew. In Luke, he's named Levi. And he is not somebody whom the crowd is excited that Jesus has called as a disciple. They're going to have a dinner together, and you're going to see people get frustrated by this. That's because Levi is a tax collector, which means that to some people, that means he's a Roman collaborator, and he's probably skimming off the top and cheating his own people. So they're very frustrated by this. But Jesus has a response that has something to do with inclusion and who is welcome at a table. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax collection station, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others reclining at the tables with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. The word of God for the people of God. And the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In this worship series, The Grammar of God, we've been looking at a few different punctuation marks, exclamation points, commas, hashtags, and question marks. Today, we're looking at the at symbol. That's that little, little lowercase a with the big circle around it. And many of you have probably seen it the most prominent in one spot. What would that be? Email. Email. I got my first email address in the mid-90s. And it was a time when internet access was charged by the hour, and it, was kept, it kept your phone line busy with the big old eeyah, eeyah, shh, if you remember that. I'd been given special permission to use the one computer in our entire school that had internet access. It was in the library archive room, and some of the students were allowed to use that for like 30 minutes a week to try out this newfangled World Wide Web. And I knew I wanted to get one of these uh, electronic mail addresses. Now, when you're 15 and you're setting up your email address, that is a crucial form of personal branding. Very critical. Because whether the service on the right side of that at symbol will still be around 10 years later, it's what you personalize on the left side of that at symbol that will be with you perhaps forever. And for some of us, sadly, it was. My first email address before the at symbol was Objurgate. Objurgate. 
I had tried so many things. I tried to find Star Wars fan. It was taken. Snake Eyes, taken. Optimus Prime, taken. Everything cool that I thought of in the mid-90s had been taken in the early 90s. I scoured a thesaurus with my friends looking for fun handles, and finally I found this word, objurgate, which means to rebuke harshly. I was 15, and that sounded cool. I had been rebuked by the internet. I would rebuke it back. If you poke around online, you're going to find many stories of regret from adults who wish that they had chosen something less immature than Princess Sassy Gal at age 14. Or don't fear the reaper while they were in college. I read of one person who was so embarrassed by their email that when they got out of college and were seeking uh, their first job out of school, they listed in very tiny font on their resume their email address as if to say, please do not contact me about this position. My first job out of college was running residence halls, and I always got a kick out of giving uh, a senior in high school and their parents a tour of the building and then getting their information so I could send them an application for housing. And in front of their parent, I would ask that senior, and what is your email address? Oh, it's, uh, you know, cutie babe1985. And the parent's looking like, oh, is it? That symbol, that at symbol, that's been around in a few different uses since the year about three, 1300 or so. Today, it's mostly in email addresses, computer coding language, and social media. It's used to tag someone. What I mean is, if I was to post a photo, say like the photos from Church Hat Sunday last week, if I wanted to post those, and I wanted you to see it, and I wanted others to see that you were in the photo, I could type the at symbol, start to type your name, the platform would suggest your name, and I'd click on it, and then you would be added to the post. You would be tagged, you would be included. It's, this at symbol, it's a way to include others, to expand reach. It's a way to say, it's not just me, it's also you, and it's all of us. When Jesus has dinner with this tax collector, Levi, others' eyes go wide, and they rebuke him harshly. Um, a tax collector? Oh, really? But when Jesus calls a disciple, it's, it's like using that at symbol to tag them, to say the love of God is not just for me, it's also for you, it's for all of us. You're tagged. You're included. You're in the picture. Levi doesn't have to put tax collector in small font on his resume because no matter what we do, no matter what embarrassing things from our past, we are still all included by God. In the early 2000s, someone started taking, well, we've been taking self-portraits a long time, but in the, around the year 2000 or so, somebody started calling them selfies. Do you know selfies? Where you take a picture of yourself Maybe even have, like, I have a selfie stick so you can get a good shot. Hello. Come on. Oh, now it's not working. Great. Well, while I'm getting that ready, uh, the selfie has been around, like I say, forever. But we gave it that name around, I think, 2013 is when it came out. And uh, it's a good way to get a picture of yourself in a good time. Oh, here we go. I have pictures of you now. There you are. So that's you, but of course, I'll get a picture of me. There, that's good. So with the selfie, uh, by 2013, it was actually in the dictionary. That's how prevalent this word became. Uh, and better yet, you don't just want a picture of yourself, you want a picture with other people. See, in England, they don't call selfies selfies. They call them ussies. Because what you want to do is say, can I get a picture of us together? And you say, can I get an ussy with you? And it's much more fun to get an ussy with people in your life. Like, let's say, let's say that you were uh, having fun on a Sunday morning, and there's like a really cool guy, perhaps somebody who wants to, like, I don't know, mentor you as a prominent storyteller or something. And you say, hey, can I get an ussy with you? Wouldn't that be fun? Oh, good. And it's just like that. It brings out joy. What an Aussie does, or a group selfie, 
It says to the people with you, you matter to me. I love having you in my life. You're in the picture. And isn't that what Jesus is saying over and over with these disciples? You are in the picture. You're in God's picture. You are included. You've been tagged all along. So friends, as we go into this world, taking a few selfies of ourselves, but hopefully some ussies with other people, remember that God has invited you. And Jesus isn't about the harsh rebuke, but about the tag, the ussie. And we are all in God's ussie, even Levi and even Cutie Babe 1985. May it be so, and amen. Friends, it is my... Oh, oh someone's going to clap? You can clap. <laughs> I won't stop you. It's my pleasure to introduce renowned storyteller Kevin Kling today. You can look up his bio and the usual talking points for this well-known Minnesota native playwright, storyteller, and commentator. Instead, I'm going to introduce him like this. Kevin Kling is one of the renowned best friends of the renowned Victor Zupank from our music team, and they write musical plays together. They had a show last night, yes? Uh, last time he was with us, it was during our online-only pandemic days, so we are glad to have him live in person today. He also took an ussie with me a moment ago, and I typed and printed the sentence days ago because I knew it would happen because that's the kind of guy he is. And possibly the best compliment I can give, last summer I played some audio of him telling his stories during a road trip as a family, and not only did my kids like the stories, they asked for them again on a fall road trip a few months later. So, friends, Kevin Kling. Thanks, Reverend Nate. That was inc I love your story. That was a great one. Oh, um, it's really good being back. Um, I, the, my times here have been just wonderful memories. So this is great to be back and on Mother's Day too, of all things. And that's what I want to talk about today, because uh, there's all kinds of motherhood. Uh, there's those mothers of nature and those of nurture, the mothers who brought us into this world. But then there's also the ones who've adopted us along the way. And today I want to celebrate all the moms in all their different forms. Celebrate is an interesting word because most of the time when we celebrate, it's, we're celebrating a paradox. Um, we celebrate sacrifice of all things. We celebrate a good harvest knowing that it's lucky we have a good harvest because that doesn't happen all the time. We celebrate birthdays because we're still here. So there's always this paradox built in. Uh, my friend Nance uh, Olson calls mothering the careful distribution of guilt. <laughs> so it's always sitting there. Oh, oh uh, Henry David Thoreau, who I just love, who you know, is known for his history, is, he's a naturalist and he lived you know, way out in the, in the country. Well, no, uh, actually, uh, he lived in his mom's backyard. Walden Pond was in his, mom, his mom's property and often she would bring him out a sandwich. Um, <laughs> A few years back, I was in Ireland with my mom. And the reason I was in Ireland is because she called me up and she said, Kevin, I heard it's hard to travel when you're 80. I'm 79, we're going to Ireland. So we went to Ireland. And I've been telling people ever since, especially since COVID, you know, we, we can travel now, it's safer to travel, it's safer to go places. Please do not put it off. Whatever you do, if you can go to Ireland, go with my mom. It's the best time. Um, <laughs> And so we're in Ireland, and we go to this castle, and my mom tells us, she goes, kids, this used to all be ours. And I was like, are you sure, mom? And in her mind, in our genealogy, we owned like about half Ireland. And I'm saying, mom, but we came over during the potato famine. What was that all about? And she just, she wouldn't even hear of it. She was already lost. She was adrift, dancing with the endorphins. And, and I thought, well, I'm not going to disturb her because... This is how she often looks at me. And I think my mom always had a view of me that didn't really match with reality. But it was okay, that was her perspective. That's the way she saw it. I remember, it's a mom thing. It's like Picasso. Picasso's mom said that if he would have been in, gone into religion, 
he would have been Pope, but he got into art and so he was Picasso. And I think that is, that is like moms, because our neighbor's mom, I know she thought our, uh, her son would have been an artist, he would have been Picasso, but he went into wastewater management, so he became Carl. Um, <laughs> It's just, it's the way moms see it, it's, it's their perspective. Uh, it, and, and that's another thing I wanna talk about today is, is perspective, is how we see things. Because one of my favorite characters in the Bible is Ruth. In fact, she is, the, the book of Ruth, when I hit that, it just hit me like a thunderbolt because almost everybody before her was either born into religion or they had some kind of vision that brought them to religion, but Ruth, chose religion. Ruth chose through love, and she was brought there through her mother-in-law. Uh, her mother-in-law brought her to this religion which, which emphasized love, and to Ruth, that was the reason to take on that religion. Um, and, and it is, it's the matter of perspective, it's the matter of choices. What mothers do we choose? What people do we choose to follow in our lives? And this leads me to the story of perception. Um, my, you probably noticed my left arm is different than my right. It's probably different than yours. Uh, when I work with kids, I say, uh, if you want to high five afterwards, you're out of luck, but we can high four all day. Um, and uh, and uh, my right arm, I lost the use of that in a motorcycle accident in, in, in 2020 or 2001. And uh, so I tell kids, if you see it move when I'm talking, tell me later, I'll get really excited. And uh, so I tell kids right away, because they're going to wonder what's up with my arms. And I've learned i got to tell adults, too, because they're out there. I wonder if he knows about his arms. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so when I was a kid, there were basically two kinds of fairy tales for me. Fairy tales I hated and fairy tales I hadn't heard yet. Because it, it always ended up bad for the guy with a disability, right? Um, and, and, and fairy tales, the, the guy with the disability was an outsider. They were never part of the society, and this really upset me. But my grandmother would say, no, Kevin, no. Stories can go any way you, that you want them to go. That's why they're called folk tales, because they would change with the times. They would change with the people, what the people needed at that time. Um, and it's why the Bible is one of the most amazing pieces of literature because it, it changes with our times. What do we need from the Bible? What do we need today? What do we need out of there? And, it, and the answers it, in story form are always in there. Um, and so anyway, uh, uh, my grandmother would say, Kevin, uh, a story can go any way the way you want it to go. And so this is one of the stories she would tell me as a kid. And it's about the days when pots and pans could talk, which indeed they still do. And a man would go to the river every day and fill two pots with water and bring them home. Well, one day a small crack developed in one of the pots and as time then went on, that crack widened until by the time the man got home, all the water had leaked out of that pot. So the pot turns to the man and says, please replace me with another pot. And the man turned to the pot and he said, look down the trail. The pot looked down the trail, and on the side of the trail with the pot that didn't have a crack, it was craggy and rocky and barren. But on the side of the path with the pot with the crack, wildflowers grew. And the man said, every day you water those flowers. Every day it's you that makes my difficult journey beautiful. I think I'll keep you. And with that, my grandmother would wrap her large Teutonic arms around me and say, I think we'll keep you. So those were the stories I got from my grandmother. And I knew that I belonged. And I knew that, that I had a family. And belonging is an interesting word. Because it's two words, right? It's another paradox. Being and longing. Being somewhere, but longing to be somewhere else. And it's when we are most happy. When we're both at safety and risk. When we are in a nest, but we're also being challenged. Um, so this is the, I wanted to tell that story because it leads into one of my favorite stories, and I just learned this story recently, and it's called The Good Mother. And it's about a boy who, who when he was born, 
his spine was a bit crooked. One leg was shorter than the other, and his head seemed to sit on one of his shoulder blades. And as time went on, those conditions seemed to exaggerate until when he was a boy and playing with the other boys, of course some of the kids would tease him, but it never seemed to affect this kid. He was always happy. He was always happy in himself with who he was. And after a time, these kids would say, you know, we're just not getting to this guy. And pretty soon he fit in. Pretty soon he belonged in the group. And the kids took care of him. They loved him. And he was part of the community. Well, one day, a girl, a young girl, moved to that community. And uh, she noticed the boy. She noticed that everyone loved this boy. And so she, it really interested her. And she watched him. And pretty soon they became friends. Well, one day, she comes up to the boy's mother. And she says, you know, your son is really remarkable. And the mother says, I know, but she said, you know, I worry about him. Who will he love? Who will find him as a mate? When he gets older, how will he marry? And his mother said, you know, I used to worry about that too. But one day he came to me and he said, mom, I know you're worried, but you don't have to be because I know who I'm gonna marry. And she said, how, how do you know that? And he said, well, before I was born and the angels were putting me together, uh, the angel that was putting my pieces on said, I've never seen a soul like this. He said, your spirit is stronger than any spirit I've known. He said, this, you, you are really quite a, a person. He said, and as a gift, I'm going to show you who you're going to marry. And he pointed across the room to this incredible soul. The boy said, I couldn't believe how beautiful she was. And then I saw the pieces he was putting on her for part of her body, and they didn't match the soul. Uh, her spine was crooked. Uh, one of her legs was shorter. Her, her head sat on a shoulder blade. And so he turned to his angel and he said, uh, angel, um, what, what is with her body? And he said, well, sometimes the body and the spirit don't really match. And the boy said, so I told him, Mom, I said, well, why don't you just give me those limbs and she can have mine? I don't care. You've already said my spirit is stronger than anything. He said, I'm not going to care. I love who I am. And the angel said, yeah, we can do that. So she got his limbs and he took her limbs and he said, but you see, Mom, I already know who I'm going to marry. She's incredible. She's the most wonderful person. So you don't have to worry about me. And his mom turned to the girl and she said, you know, my son, if anyone can see through the thin veil of these worlds, it, it, it would be my son. So I believe him, so I'm not worried about him. And the girl heard this. And over time she thought, I wonder who that girl is. So she's looking around the village, you know, who is it? Who could this be? And she didn't notice anyone that was really connecting with this boy. And then in time, they became even closer. And she thought, I, I hope that's me. And in time she thought, well, that better be me. And she came up to the boy and said, will you marry me? And the boy said, are you kidding? Of course, you're my best friend. Are you? This is the best day of my life. He said, of course, I'll marry you. So they were married. And they lived years and years into old age. And now, OK, every year wasn't great. I mean, they did have their hardships. This isn't a fairy tale, after all. And they got to old age. And uh, they were sitting there happy together. And the boy said, I just can't, I can't believe how lucky I am that you're in my life. And she turned to the boy with a smile on her face and she said, I know luck had nothing to do with it. She said, I have to tell you, your mom told me the whole story. And the boy hugged her and he kissed her even though he had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> That's why that story is called The Good Mother. <laughs> the mom already knew that it was just a matter of perspective. A lot of times it's just a matter of how you see someone that pulls the veil from your eyes. And I think grace works that a lot of times. A lot of times we think that the divine is going to come down from the above, but, a lot, it, but meanwhile, it's among us all the time. Um, and so to notice that. Uh, I, I want to close with a story, and this is the story that I, I, I'm really excited to get to tell today. Um, this is a story, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it because it's by a man named Michael Cotter. And I worked with Michael Cotter in... Uh, um, the National Storytelling Festival down in Jonesboro, Tennessee, where all these 
I mean, world-class storytellers were telling stories. And all of a sudden, this Minnesota farmer gets up in his plaid shirt and his pants, and his hands are in his pockets, and he's shuffling back and forth. And everyone's thinking, oh, man, how did this guy get up here? I mean, he clearly doesn't seem like a storyteller. And then he started. In his quiet way, in his quiet way, he won everybody over and blew everyone away. His authenticity, the, it, it, you can't fake authenticity. And this farmer's stories just swept through the whole festival and he was the hit of the whole festival. So I wanted to tell you this story because this is, pro it's in my top three favorite stories of my life. And it's, it's by Michael Cotter. And so I wanted to, to give you a hint of what he's like and it's called The Killdeer. My name is Michael Cotter, and uh, I'm a third generation farmer from Austin, Minnesota, where the land is flat and the soil is black. Now, things began to change back during the Depression, but I really think they started to change in the 1960s. And I think it had to do with the introduction of the 100 horsepower tractor. I mean, prior to that, it was 20, 30, 50. That was usually the largest that came out with these big diesel engines, suddenly they had a 100 horse, and that was amazing. And then we started seeing double wheels to utilize all that power, and then they came out with the 200 horse, and it seemed like there would be no end to all of these diesel engines. But the story I wanted to tell you is about the time I started to come along one spring day along one of these drainage ditches, and I'm on one of those four-wheel tractors, and I pull up one of the, I'm pulling those discs, and it's maybe 30 feet wide, and I had a lot to do that day. And the black diesel smoke was flowing from this tractor, eight tires moving fast, because there was a lot of ground to cover, and I was in a hurry, and I'm going along, and all of a sudden, in front of me, is this little bird, and it's called a killdeer. And they're always there, there's a lot of them. And they have this characteristic, killdeer, killdeer, it's a unique sound. It sounds like kill deer, kill deer. But the way they protect their nest is to lay their eggs at the edge of those ditches uh, along those little stones because they look just like them. And they put their eggs deep in that black soil and you can't tell them from the stones. But the birds protect that nest with drama. She pretends, and I've seen this a hundred times, you get near the nest, and the bird starts to hold her ground. And that's what happened this morning. She starts her drama, and at first she's in front of me, like, like her wing is broken, and she's dragging it, and she's fluttering, and trying to draw the tractor, this big machine, off to the side. I know that's what she's trying to do, and I know I won't see the eggs, but there's nothing that I can do but keep going. Pretty soon she's back in front of me again, this time more dramatic. Both wings are now broken, and she's just staying clear of these huge tires that are rolling fast, again, trying to pull me off to the side, and I know there's nothing I can do but keep going. I know I'll never see the nest. And generally, that's as far as it goes. But stories about things that are different, and this bird is back for a third time, and I don't see her this time, but I hear her. Now, if you can imagine the roar of this diesel engine and this piercing screech comes into my cabin, this screech from this little bird. And I look down in front of those big tires, and that little bird is standing. I can, I can see her beak open, screeching as loud as she can screech, and these big tires are coming toward her. And it, it's like so many times in life, the pretending is over, and she's taking her stand. As I see her, it, the tires are almost on her, and I slam on the clutch, and with the engine pulling hard, there's this terrific bang as the tractor stops under this load, and I pull up the throttle, and I hit the kill switch, and from the roar of that engine that I've heard for almost an hour, it's silent. That silence, it, it's unbelievable. For the first time, I hear the water running in the drainage ditches. I hear the birds along the ditch bank singing. And now I see the bird standing in front of the tires is also silent. And that silence, it seems so powerful. 
but now what do I do? I get out on the deck of the tractor, and, and I'm a parent at this time, and I've got young children, and I, I, I think I'll use my parenting voice because there's no one there to make fun of me or to ask me why I say to the bird, you've got to show me where it is. You've got to show me your nest. I didn't expect anything to happen, and there was quite a moment of hesitation. And then, like she understood, she moved across the front of my tractor to the other side, just beyond the dual wheels. She spread her wings and sat down, and as she did, I saw the eggs. So the bird is sitting there, right beside my tires, as the hydraulic lever I, I used to bring up the disc is up on its transport wheels, but one of my wheels is lined up with the nest where she was sitting. So with the other hydraulic lever, I lift this big 30-foot disc and it folds up with this cracking and banging and she just sat there. And I rolled past over the top of her and I set all that machinery back down. I opened up the throttle and the black diesel smoke rolled and pretty soon those eight tires rolled and I looked back as quickly as I could through the smoke and way in the distance, now that patch of unworked soil sat a lone bird and I knew our time together was over. That's the first story I ever told. So that's Michael Cotter, to protect and nurture. Uh, and I'd like to finish with a quick story that's a, a Mother's Day story of all the love that we give, a little bit love coming back. And it's a buddy of mine who, was, uh, uh, who, who lived in a, a refugee camp in South Sudan. And uh, he was there with his wife and his daughter um, waiting to move on to their next world. And while they were in the camp, they didn't have any money. It was really hard conditions. And he said his wife and his daughter went into to the market one day and uh, they were shopping and she saw these apples and she thought her daughter was so wonderful she was gonna give her daughter a treat. So she, she said, honey, I'm gonna buy you an apple. You can pick whichever apple you want. And so her daughter took an apple and uh, then she took another one and she's looking back and forth and she took a bite out of one of the apples. But then she quickly took a bite out of the other apple. And her mom's like, what? And she, I raised her better than that. And it really hurt her. She says, what's she doing? And then her daughter held out one of the apples and said, here, mommy, this one's the sweetest. So this is to all the mothers out there. You're the sweetest. And uh, thank you. And happy Mother's Day. And thank you, Reverend Nate, for inviting me today. And thank you to my buddy, Victor Zupank. <laughs> Today is Pentecost Sunday, and that means we return to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. This moment in the Scripture, in the Bible, this is often called the uh, birthday of the church, as it were. And Jesus has been resurrected, and the disciples who are witnessing his ascension, and now these disciples and the crowds, they're experiencing the Holy Spirit in a new way, just as Jesus told them that they would. A reading from Acts. This, Jesus said to the disciples, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would all sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Every once in a while, someone confides in me, Pastor Nate, why did all the people in the Bible get to experience God in these amazing ways? Like that story at Pentecost with fire dancing over their head. Why do they get that, but we don't? They got to feel God then, and we should now too. And I get that. Now, if you need a talking, burning bush to, to experience God, I don't know if they have that at Bachman's. And if you need a big, booming voice from the heavens, I think the closest we're going to get is that lightning and thunder we got on Friday night down in Richfield. Did you hear that? Holy buckets. Now, if you are open, however, to the Holy Spirit in your midst, if you are open in your heart to being, having your heart strangely warmed, if you believe good happens when people are on fire for God gathered together, I do believe we can experience God in a tremendous way. I do believe we can experience a rebirth of the Spirit as at Pentecost. Today's final bit of punctuation for the Grammar of God worship series is the ampersand, a.k.a. that squiggle. That squiggle that if I asked you to draw it, I think all of us would probably draw it a little bit differently. It's a shorthand symbol for the word and. It's been around for about a thousand years, and it's a derivative that comes from Latin. In Latin, the words that would be spelled et, et, et is and. It's that plus it's this Latin per se, which is Latin for in essence, uh, which would mean something like this, like uh, I'm not saying we all need coffee right now per se, and it wouldn't hurt. So, et per se, ampersand. Now, you probably see this at symbol in many places. You've seen it in business logos, for example. You've seen maybe people trying to save a little bit of room in what they're typing. Instead of typing out the word A-N-D, they can save a couple spaces by using the ampersand instead. My favorite use of the ampersand is for teamwork. The ampersand is for teamwork. When the credits roll at the movies, pay attention to who the writers are. Who wrote the script? If there is a story by credit, that means that that person or those persons came up with the story, essentially, but they did not write the actual script. If there is one name as the writer, first of all, they deserve a high five. That is a big job, okay? But if there is a written by, and there are two names linked with an ampersand, this person and this person, that means that they're a writing team. They wrote that script together. If there is a written by, and it has several names in it, perhaps separated by a comma, maybe a couple ampersands in there, that means that these are people who wrote separate from each other, or rewrote each other's work to the point where it's hard to tell exactly who did what, so they all get credited. It also sometimes means that script had some issues. The point is, the ampersand says we are a team. We're in this together. It's not me here, you there, you there, you there. It's me 
and you, and you, and you, and you. And that's how God works through the Holy Spirit, seeking ways to link us together, to show what love looks like when we are all open to having our hearts strangely warmed, as we witnessed at Pentecost, to remind us that we are not alone, that we are linked by this and symbol. That this is the Holy Spirit glue for God. I'll give you an example. When I preach at weddings, and I love preaching at weddings, I often will have a moment where I talk about that ampersand. So, uh, Kent and Sue, you're the first couple I see. I'm going to use your names. Is that okay? All right, thank you. Okay. So, uh, you, you performed my wedding, Kent, so this feels appropriate. Uh, so, when I'm talking in the sermon, in the wedding, I will sometimes observe that of the people gathered there, some of us only ever knew the, uh, uh, I'll use your names, some of us knew Kent pre-Sue, and some of us knew Sue pre-Kent, but then some of us only ever knew them as Kent and Sue, Sue and Kent. And when we gather for that wedding and all the marriage to come after it, what we're celebrating is that and between them, that linking piece. It's all about the team. Now, in this worship series, we've experienced a short video about one of the outreach ministries of this church, including UMCOR Sunday and UMCOR overall, UMCOR being the United Methodist Committee on Relief. It's our boots on the ground across the world as the United Methodist denomination. We had a video about people who are refugees uh, telling her story in Meals on Wheels and the tie blankets that we made for the students of Caring for Children Early Learning Center. We have one more for you, and I think it's pretty exciting. It's about one of our new signature ministries for welcoming neighbors who are refugees with our new partner, the Minnesota Council of Churches. Now, one of the reasons that I am proud to be United Methodist Church, believe it or not, is the bureaucracy. But here's why. We have so many ways to make an impact across the world, including our 13 general agencies that are equipped to connect local churches and ministry around the world. And that includes six general boards. It's the General Board of Church and Society, Discipleship, now, one of the reasons Higher Education, to well, talking to myself here, Higher Education and Ministry, West Path, which is Benefits, and Global Ministries. And Global Ministries is where UMCOR is. Now, you can say what you want to about institutions being too big and complex. This is how United Methodists get organized to do good across the world. And the General Board of Global Ministries, over the last couple years, has released something they call mustard seed grants. Remember, Jesus taught us faith the size of a mustard seed. Good things can grow from that. They've been giving out these grants to local churches to equip United Methodists to get them engaged in ministry to migrants who are in their midst. Now, here are a few sample grant recipient churches. Let's take a look at what they've been doing so far.
So those are a few examples from the General Board of Global Ministries, churches who have had these grants and what they've done with it, bikes and food and uh, clothing drives and so on. Pretty cool stuff. I wonder what would happen if we got one of those grants. Well, guess what? We did. So we applied for and received that grant just before Christmas. I think December 23rd, we found out we were going to get this. It's a very happy Christmas gift, and we have them here for us. Uh, thanks for bringing in all of that stuff there. Uh, Your Honor, every one of these letters is addressed to Santa Claus. Okay, kind of had that Miracle on 34th Street vibe, didn't it, with all the mail? All right, now church, these carts, these are for our signature ministries to welcome neighbors who are refugees. With this rack and tote system, which is highly portable, look how easy that glides, right? We can now set these out in our uh, narthex area right there by the front doors. So every time we want to do a drive for our refugee uh, neighbors, we can, as a church, bring it and put it right there. And we can put labels on here so everybody knows which bin gets what kind of item. And we can invite our neighbors to do the same. It's a pretty exciting system, and it looks nice, and it's efficient, too. Uh, you, this will help us for our drives for our new partner, the Minnesota Council of Churches. You may notice on one of these racks, we have that KitchenAid stock pot. Do folks remember those stock pots? So this fall, some of us went to Cub Foods for our grocery shopping, and we started collecting those Super Saver stamps to earn KitchenAid cookware. And we decided to go for the stock pots. That was the highest ticket item. And we thought, let's do that because an eight-quart stock pot, many cultures do soups and stews, and that can feed a large family. And in November or so, I think I got to tell you, by then, we, I think we had like three or four of them, which is pretty exciting. But friends, we got seven. We got seven of these, and that is the power of the ampersand. You did this, and you, and you, and you. We all did this together with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's a powerful thing. That's Pentecost. That's the Holy Spirit in our midst. So friends, remember Pentecost, that's not just that first birthday of the church. It's a rebirth of the Holy Spirit, and that includes our team today and all the good that we can do for our neighbors tomorrow. I'm going to ask you to extend a hand toward these crock pots or, or stock pots and these racks and let us pray a blessing. Holy Spirit, thank you for the gift of this grant and these refreshed ways to serve you. May these stand sturdy to hold life-changing goods and food for our new neighbors. Bless these stock pots as they help families get a good hot meal. Help us to be a brave church and invite friends and neighbors to be a part of this welcoming ministry. We are open to your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.